Let's take a look at the syllabus first. Nothing out of the ordinary. <clears throat> is, there, is the textbook over in the bookstore, or have you found a source for it? That's probably the best way to put it. Have you found, found a source for the textbook? The, the Stephen System Safety for the 21st Century. There's a bunch of them that I use, system safety uh, books. That's, I'm trying a different one. Um, the one that I really liked is out of print, probably because I liked it. Uh, it's, it's, called, it's by Roland Moriarty, it's uh, System Safety Engineering. And it's probably too heavy on the engineering. That's probably why it's not in use anymore. Uh, this one is pretty heavy on the engineering too, but it's a little more uh, user friendly, I guess, than the, than the Roland Moriarty book is. Um, I'm going to have three non cumulative exams in this class. You'll be glad to know that. Um, one thing that I'm going to implement, and I kind of hated to do this, but it sort of presented itself. Uh, I would rather, now I'm going to require that you use a calculator rather than an app on, a, on a, some other device. Uh, calculators are cheap uh, and you don't need a, a really complicated one that walks and talks and pees itself and all that sort of thing. You know, uh, maybe that's for you and you do, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know get, but get one, just get a cheap one that can do you know, the, the squares and square roots, logs and, and trig functions, stuff like that. Um, so, I won't go into any more detail on that, but it's just, like I said, I, it's come to the, the point that I really need to require a separate device uh, for that. Um, as usual, I give you the, uh, uh, the exam and all the, the, the examination sheets and all that sort of thing. And um, uh, the um, equation sheets are available, and you will have all of the, all the, the cumulative equation sheets available for all the exams. So on exam one, uh, you'll just get the equation sheet for exam one, but since the probability propagates through the whole semester, you'll get the exam one equation sheet for all the exams, and also the exam two equation sheet if you want it for the exam three, even though it won't be that relevant, but it'll be available to you. Uh, Oh, and another thing I'm, I'm for my exam policy that I'm changing, that I was kind of forced to change, is um, I'm going to want, uh, under, like, less under extent, really extenuating circumstances, a two week notice if you're going to miss an exam, you need to reschedule it. Right? Like I said, it's just kind of getting to the point where I'm having a lot of trouble with rescheduling exams and do that sort of thing. So give me two weeks notice, please, before the exam. Yeah, Richard. Uh, the equation sheets for the what you have on whiteboard, equation sheet number one. Uh huh. You actually got a homework? Yeah. Sorry. Did, did I, did did I mess yeah. that up? Oh, crap. Um, okay. And would you send me an email? I'll fix that. Yes. And uh, yeah, because that, that happens sometimes. Um, I get into the zone when I'm doing blackboard, and <laughs> it bores the crap out of me doing black blackboard because it takes so long to upload. And I inevitably make mistakes like that. So yeah, anything, any time, any mistake like that that you see, just send me an email and I'll fix it. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So the exams, there's three of them, essentially 25% a piece, more or less. You know, I don't exactly, they're not exactly equally weighted the way I always do them. Um, project will be the other 25%. And what we're going to do is spend the last day of class, and if we need it, if the class is large enough. Uh, we'll spend uh, the, um, uh, at the three hours that are allocated for the during the final exam period to finish up the presentations. Because what I want you to do is a 10 to 15 page paper plus about a half hour presentation. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail as we go along. Um, it'll be a fairly in-depth presentation. I want you to take a, a hazard analysis technique that I don't talk about. Uh, and do a presentation where you teach the class how to do it, and then give us an example of how, it, of how it's done. Okay, so I, and I don't think that it's possible to do that in less than 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, so you, you, it'll be a you know, fairly in-depth presentation. And that'll be the other 25% of the grade. Um, mm -hmm. Homework, I do the, the homework will be just like in QM. Every, every uh, after every, um, a lecture, there will be a set of homework problems, and then the following week I'll go over those homework problems in class. And grading, same as, same as, as I've done before, 
Uh, those are the topics. There's only six topics, but they tend to be kind of lengthy. Uh, the first exam will essentially be only on, it'll be uh, uh, officially on topics one and two, but it's going to be mostly on two, probability, because we're going to spend a lot of time on probability. Um, then there's, there's a schedule. You can see it as well as I can. Um, the um, uh, last two weeks, this is the last day of class, and then if we need it, uh, depending on how many people we end up with in this class, we'll uh, uh, use the 29th, which is during the week of our final exams, to finish up the presentations. Because a 30 or 40 minute presentation, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, four, six, seven, eight. Uh, so we probably need about three quarters of an hour per person with break and all that sort of thing. So we probably not, are not going to get through that in three hours. So we'll probably need the second, the, the second week to finish up. And I will assign the order. Everybody is, should be prepared by the 22nd. Because what, I'm gonna, what I always do, so, is somebody, so nobody gets the advantage of an extra week, you have to hand in your, your um, uh, written report on the 22nd and you should all have your oral report prepared by the 22nd because what I'll do, you know my handy dandy uh, random number generator, I will randomly generate who goes in the order, okay? And then uh, whoever goes, uh, whoever ends up first, I'll just keep going and we'll get about 45 minutes per person. And if you get pushed off till the 29th, well, don't blame me, blame Excel. Okay? So if we need to go to the 29th, we will. We'll see how many people in, uh, and remain in the class. Decide to. Okay. Questions? Um, you guys know how to get in touch with me. I'm mean, mostly around evenings, or in afternoons, or early evenings and times. Um, I have slightly less availability this semester because I have an undergraduate class on Tuesdays and Thursdays from uh, 1.25 to 2.20. So it kind of takes a chunk out of Tuesday and Thursday afternoons for me. Uh, but uh, I'm usually around on Fridays, even though I don't have official office hours, and you catch me in between. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, whenever I'm around, just, just come and see me. Uh, anything else I can think of from this? <coughs> Looks like the, the textbook's available on the, on online if you go search it through, search through um, the library database. You could Oh, there is? Good. Good. Okay. Does it, which edition is it? Um, there's one in here that says the updated and revised edition of System Safety 2000. One, there's one in 2004 and one in 2012. Okay. Because my hard copy edition says the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever, whatever you can find, if it's available through the library, that's great. Then don't, don't, pay, don't pay 150 bucks for it or whatever it is. It's, uh, I'm, I'm appalled by the cost of textbooks. So, yeah, whatever source, that sounds great. Thanks, Kyle. All right, having said that, where am I? Okay, let's, take a, let's take a look at, the, at the, the introductory stuff. And I will tell you right now, um, this class will be a little bit different from most system safety classes, classes that you'll run into. Somehow most of them manage to drone on for an entire semester about what I'm gonna talk about during the first hour. Okay? I don't think it's that profound that it, that it deserves an entire semester worth of talking, but most people that teach this course seem to think so. So I disagree with them. So this is what, uh, this, the, this is the probably more or less what you would spend an entire semester on in most places. Uh, the rest of the class is going to be safety applications for techniques that are used in reliability engineering, in um, operations research, and in probability and statistics. All of those have safety applications. And that's what this class really is going to be. Uh, the only thing that is strictly safety, and even that's not so much strictly safety, is the final topic which is hazard analysis. Um, and hazard analysis really only is the reliability engineering applied to, to, to safety analysis, okay? Uh, and that's usually what I think gets short shrift in a lot of the, uh, in a lot of the um, uh, system safety classes that were offered. 
around, uh, around the country at different places and then Rural specifically. So, let's talk about, uh, let, 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 let's do a, a concentrated class of uh, system safety and then we'll go on to the, the other stuff. Um, I had been using this, this for a, um, uh, a textbook. Uh, the more I looked at it, the more I really didn't like it very much. Uh, it, it is a, Barr's book is something that is very um, user-friendly and industry-oriented. So it's not bad. It's just that it it, it lacks a lot of a lot of um, um, substance, as far as I'm concerned. I, I think that it's kind of the traditional approach to system safety, where you just talk about life cycles and ad nauseum different system safety program plans, and and I think that those are so self-explanatory that I can't imagine talking about them for an entire semester. Uh, so that's why I got rid of it, and I used something that's a little more had a little more substance to it. Uh, Brower is good because it has more of an engineering approach to safety in general. It has some system safety in it, but just in general, it has, it's a really good um, uh, safety textbook. It might be a good reference book to have in, in your library. And then this is the one that I really like, System Safety Engineering Management, that's out of print. And I ordered a, a, a copy of it a few years ago, and they told me it was out of print, but I could get a special printing of it for only $300. So I got it because it, it's, so, it's so rare, and now it's probably available somewhere electronically. Uh, but I have uh, one of the final printed copies of it that, that, that was around. Uh, just about everything, most of the examples that I use in this class come from Golden Moriarty. Uh, it's a, like I said, it's really good, uh, but it's not that user friendly. So I try to translate it for you. That's the, that will be my, my goal. Uh, okay, I feel compelled to, to define a system again. We talked about this in, in human factors, I know. Uh, but a system is really depends on how you want to bound, how you want to define the boundary of it. And so if you have um, a, a human machine system, like an airplane, for instance, or, or a car, or something like that, you tend to define that system in terms of um, an airplane, for example, in terms of the aircraft itself and the human operator inside the aircraft. However, that in, if you think about it, that's kind of an artificial boundary because why don't you include airspace as part of the system? You can, but typically when we talk about the, the, the user interface in a system like that, we just talk about the, the, the hardware and then the person that's operating it. So really it depends on how you want to define the boundaries in your system as to what defines the boundaries. Uh, and of course, this, this is the big thing that uh, that sometimes doesn't get, doesn't get um, uh, enough attention is the operating environment because that will have a profound effect on it. Especially if you're driving. Okay, a nice sunny day like this, probably not a problem of driving. Whereas last week about this time, it was quite a different operating environment and the driving was quite different than, than it is today. So that can have an effect. Okay? Uh, so it's more, so it's really important probably to uh, enlarge your system as much as possible and then define the subsystems of it. And that's probably the most effective way to go about that, it is uh, uh, to make it as large as possible and then define your subsystems and do your analysis on those. Uh, this is the thing that gets an awful lot of attention in system safety. And like I said, I still don't really understand why other than the fact that it's applied over and over and over. Uh, this is something that's kind of like the NIOSH lifting equation. Uh, if you haven't gone through ergonomics yet, don't worry about it too much. But it is a uh, it, it is a tool that industry can apply very easily, and therefore they like it a lot, and they use it over and over and over, whether it is relevant or not. Okay, and that's kind of, and this is relevant. It's just that it's it's kind of like to me, and I probably might get myself in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's kind of like SMS. When you think about SMS, it's an extremely simple framework. I mean, and yet we talk about it on nausea. All it is is, is a framework of four pillars. I think it's four pillars, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the four pillars, and then it defines what those are. Now, populating them is a little bit more of a, uh, of a challenge. I think it's a little bit more of a problem because you have to figure out how it adapts to your environment. But we talk on nausea about the pillars, and that's kind of what this is. Uh, you know, you, you, the design, there's, there's nothing trivial about design, but to say that the design is the first stage in the system safety life, life cycle, like I said, is not profound at all. Now, 
actually going out and doing the design, that's a different, different story altogether. Uh, but nevertheless, if you think about this, this is very simple. You do the design, then you develop your system, then you test it to make sure that it's going to work, and then you produce it, uh, then it's in operation for as long as it will function, and then you either retire it or dispose it of it, or something that they neglect here, you, um, uh, you retrofit it, in which case you kind of have to go through that cycle again. Okay? Uh, but I really don't know a lot, unless I want to talk a lot about design, and that's so system specific that it's kind of useless to talk about it, uh, I don't really know what else to say about that. It's a, it, it, a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. And as a matter of fact, it's a good thing to keep in mind when you are doing any kind of a program plan for any kind of a, of a system that doesn't even have to be a safety system. And you can go through all of these design stages and then recycle through it if you want to, if you want to retrofit. And so that's the, the system life cycle. And that's really all I have to say about it. System safety then, and I've already kind of talked about this somewhat, I think system safety is really the applications of things like operations research. Who, is her, who, know, who, who does not, let me put it this way, who does not know what operations research is? Have you all heard of operations research and know what it is? Okay, um, because it's, uh, operations research is usually taught in, um, in, in either industrial engineering and sometimes in a less rigorous form in business schools. And in business schools, operations research tends to be, depending on where you, what school you're talking about, tends to be less rigorous, I think. Uh, but you know, what, we, what, what they do with it is try to come up with quantitative methods, it's a highly quantitative uh, um, field and they come up with quantitative methods for uh, making decisions. That's why we have a whole topic on decision analysis uh, for quantitative me methods for simulating systems. So we're going to talk about simulation quite a bit because you can you can simulate a system and and uh, um, run it so that it operates a million times and you would wait 10 lifetimes for that to actually happen. As long as you have a good simulation, you can find out what's going to happen over a million operations in the system. Um, reliability is, is, is um, reliability engineering is a big, big part of most industrial engineering programs as well. Uh, it's how they know when to end your warranty, because it's just before it fails. Okay? And that's planned, to be sure of that, because every component, every uh, uh, um, device, everything that goes on the market, is uh, there's, there's a known reliability because they test it. I mean, unless it's so inexpensive that it doesn't matter to them and it doesn't have a warranty anyway. But electronic devices all have known mean times between failure. And MTBF is a, is a rarely, I mean, that's mean time between failures, is a, an extremely important, and sometimes it's, it's a um, proprietary, um, a proprietary number with some with some uh, companies because they don't want anybody to know what their mean time between failures are. But if you look at their warranties, you can probably figure it out because if it's five years, you know that they that they know that that thing's going to fail in five years in one month, okay. and, and, and that's and they plan it that way. So anyway, all of this, all of these these disciplines have a an application to safety because we uh, human beings make errors. Human beings and systems have a reliability associated with the, with, with the way they, they uh, operate, with the way they, they perform. Uh, so we can model the systems that people are in in a way that's similar to modeling systems that don't have people in them. Okay? It's just that people are a little bit harder to characterize, although from, uh, as uh, we talk about human factors, there are known error rates for different activities. And if you apply those error rates, you can put them in uh, as a component in the system, the same as a, a, as a, 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 you know, a, as a uh, resistor or something else that's going to fail. They're a little bit less predictable, but nevertheless, you can model them. And that's what we're going to try to do. Um, so anything else that I want to talk about? Uh, so 
what, so we're, we're basically interested in the system reliabilities of people in them um, and how it affects uh, safety uh, and also property and material. That's what it affects. All right. Um, this is a Roland, uh, Roland Moriarty uh, definition of hazard, something that is uh, that can cause injury or death, okay? um, and loss of equipment or property. But it only becomes danger when it's not controlled. So dangers uh, when you control a hazard, it's not a danger. When it's uncontrolled, it becomes a danger. Um, risk is uh, something that we're going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, but it is usually determined by things that have probability and frequency of occurrence. And I'm sure you've all seen it, we'll talk about it later, but risk, uh, you've all seen the risk matrix, right? And it doesn't, there's, there's any number of boxes where you have, this is increasing probability of occurrence, and this is increasing frequency of occurrence. Got two E's in there. And as the frequency and the probability increases, this area down here might be might be the red area. You know, I don't have colors. Where you have, need a lot of attention, you need to do something about it right away, because it's a high frequency of occurrence and a high probability of occurrence. Whereas down in this square, then this 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 will be the green area, and that's low frequency, low probability of occurrence. It's usually called a risk matrix. And every company uses these. Eh, I, I have. Uh, they can be useful, but they're not over applied. Uh, but however, again, I think that they tend to get over, over applied, so they uh, we over rely on them, and therefore they lose their usefulness. Um, but um, I was going somewhere else with that. I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the risk matrix. Like I said, it's called a risk matrix. We'll talk about that more late, later when we're talking about decision analysis and making decisions. Um, so it's a, essentially hazard probability versus hazard severity um, is the primary uh, determinants in, 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 in uh, determining risk. All right, uh, this I thought was kind of interesting. This is from Barr. Uh, the textbook that I used to use, and again, I don't want to over, I don't, don't want to dwell on this, but it's, it's an interesting way to think about uh, the process of system safety, where you start out with objectives and describing the system. This is kind of the design stage, and hazard analysis, okay, and risk evaluation. Now, hazard analysis is what we're going to be doing in the final topic, and what you'll be doing for your paper is a, a, a hazard analysis technique. There are tons of them out there. There are, uh, and the trouble with them is, is that they tend to be variants, slight variants on, on other ones. Uh, what I'm going to try to talk about here are the system safety uh, hazard analysis techniques that are truly different from each other. Okay? Um, that don't, aren't uh, aren't slight variants on each other. Uh, but then after that, they have risk evaluation. Okay, that, this is my hazard. Now, what's the probability and frequency? Okay, so what's my risk of, of, uh, of that happening? And then how to control it, and uh, then testing our controls, and then our, uh, and then whether or not the, 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 the risk is acceptable, if we, go, we have a feedback loop, and if it is acceptable, then we just go ahead and, and, and uh, do what we were going to do. Um, I think that this is, Kind of a critical steps right here is hazard identification and analysis, um, and that's what we're going to concentrate on is the hazard identification and analysis there. Um, and I kind of got overly verbose here, but um, this is uh, this is the, the energy sources is a particular type of analysis called barrier or, or energy analysis, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But there's a bunch of other techniques that we're talking about, too. Okay. Um, it, this is also a stage, a yeah, hazard identification stage, is when you can possibly do uh, alternate system evaluations to see what there might be 
uh, less hazard associated, fewer, fewer hazards associated with it. And also here, and this is important, I just realized that when I put that there, is the, is the, 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 the regulations. And we'll find that in system safety, there aren't a heck of a lot of regulations. There are a lot of voluntary standards. None of them are uh, in the CFRs, for instance, like the, the, all the regulations in 1910. Um, you won't run into anything in system safety like that. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are some mill standards that are applicable outside of the military environment. There are some ANSI standards, um, but all of them are voluntary and uh, none of them are, are actually um, uh, regulations. Uh, these are a couple of the things. Fault tree analysis and failure modes and effects analysis. These are sort of the two archetypes for all hazard analysis techniques, and those are the two that I'm going to be talking about in the most detail. Um, but almost everything uh, is a variant on one of those. If we look at uh, root cause analysis, for instance, uh, it incorporates fault tree analysis techniques. Uh, there's another one called failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, but it's essentially a fault, uh, uh, and, and this is FMEA. Yeah, you may have heard that abbreviation before. Failure modes and effects analysis. Um, but um, those are the two, what I would think of as the, as the union archetypal types of analyses. If you're in the union archetypes, otherwise, never mind. Uh, this evaluation. Uh, this is the, this is the uh, the, the uh, um, risk matrix approach for risk evaluation. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, some other ways to evaluate risk event, uh, when we get to the decision analysis. Uh, but um, this is the overwhelmingly uh, the one that is used in industry. So it it, 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 be, uh, it behooves us to, to think about it a little bit. Um, for controlling hazards, um, this is something that is um, a little bit different than the standard um, engineering controls, uh, administrative controls, training, and PPE. And this I ran across from Bar also. And so I, I put it in, in here just because it's different than what we usually think about. Uh, first of all, it is retrofit or influencing design. That's the standard engineering control. And of course it is the best, but if you have to retrofit, we all know that that's very expensive and probably the least feasible to do. Uh, it's possible, but it's, it's expensive and usually the, the last thing that we want to do because of the, of the time expense involved. Uh, safety devices, fail safety devices, are um, something like lockout tagout. Uh, is probably a uh, safety device type, and it's not very hard to uh, it's not very hard to implement. Uh, but in a way, but it can get more complicated than that. In which case, you would do uh, it would, would really be an engineering control. So safety devices are kind of kind of run the gamut from engineering to administrative controls in their complexity and cost. Uh, warning devices, the same thing. And it's kind of maybe lockout tagout would be better as a warning device. Uh, or safety device, I'm not quite sure which one I would call that, but uh, warning device is the same way. It, it runs a continuum uh, from whether it is engineering and costly and retro, to retrofit it or whether it's something a little bit uh, simpler. Like, uh, well, let, let's call a warning device might be something like, like tape on the floor or caution tape, that, that sort of thing. It's a warning, it's a device, but it's really easy to do. Whereas if you put something in that has, it has claxons and and lights going off and all that sort of thing, that's a lot more expensive and harder to do. And then the special procedures and training, this is your administrative training uh, uh, part of it. And this is sort of the, the traditional approach to, the, to, to safety, uh, but like I said, I think that it's a little bit more, it's a little bit different, and uh, I thought that, that was interesting because of that. Injury, death, damage to the system, that's an accident when something actually happens. Um, there's a lot of discussion about this term, near miss. Okay, whether it's a, is it a near miss or is it a near accident or what really is it? Uh, and I sat and thought about it a lot. Um, but I think that at least 
um, linguistically, near miss does make sense. I missed it, but I was darn close to it. Okay? So I, I think that that's probably as good a term as any. If you still don't like near miss, <laughs> what, what would you prefer to call it? I don't know. This doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> well, well, nearly uh, avoided the accident. Um, maybe a near hit. <laughs> because, but, but once again, uh, um, I nearly hit it, or I missed it, but I was close. So, but anyway, uh, it, it, it is so common in safety parlance to use the term near, near miss that I think that everybody understands what it's supposed to be, no matter how linguistically awkward it might be. Uh, so anyway, that's almost an accident. We all know that. Again, uh, I thought that this was an interesting, and most of this introductory stuff, this is what Barr talks about for his entire book. So that's why I'm pulling a lot of this stuff out of bar because uh, I thought what he had there was good. It just I thought it was a little bit excessive for the for, for uh, the uh, import and the amount of uh, substance that was in it. Um, but anyway, I kind of like this uh, diagram of, of uh, the precursors of an accident uh, because he says they're preliminary events, and you can think of this in, ter in, re in terms of reasonable model. This is just another statement of reasons model and the HVACs model that we talk about. But we have these, pre what, the way he formulated it is preliminary events, things like long working hours, poor maintenance, poor, poor, poor training, poor design, that sort of thing. Those are precursors, okay? And then the, uh, the trigger events are what's caused by those preliminary events. Um, so long working hours might increase error rates, poor maintenance might cause a spark that doesn't necessarily start a fire, but it might. Uh, so those are the initiating events that are predicated by the preliminary events. And then they have an intermediate event um, that uh, if you have a redundant system, you might reduce the likelihood or the effects of error. Well, that's probably a better way to put it. It doesn't necessarily reduce the likelihood of error, but it reduces the likelihood that an error will be expressed or the effects of an error. Because if you have two people doing the same job, the first guy um, might, might miss it, but the second one would. Or if you have circuits in parallel, just like the old um, Christmas lights. Okay? You have serious Christmas lights, one of them goes out, you've got to check every one of the lights, right? And, but if you have them in parallel, and one of them goes out, you know exactly which one went out, but the, but the system's still functional. Right? So that's the, that's the redundancy. We'll talk a little bit about systems and, and networks in the, net, in the third topic. And then the, the flammable materials in addition to the poor, so you have poor conditions, or poor maintenance conditions, might cause a spark, and the presence of flammable materials would cause a fire. So that would be the intermediate event that would allow the preliminary event expressed through initiating event to actually cause an accident. So that would, that would cause a fire. Okay? But if you have lack of redundancy and, and then you have uh, long working hours, um, that would uh, lead to someone making an error which, for which there is no redundancy for someone to pick up the error, and then that, that would cause an accident as well. So like I said, this is an accident model which really is, uh, like I said, another uh, statement of reasons. Um, like I said, the standards and handbooks are really the uh, source of most system safety, um, I wouldn't even call them, they're, they're voluntary regulations, let's put it that way. Uh, and they're, they are consensus standards, that's the word I was trying to think of. Uh, we talked about that in ergonomics. Uh, consensus standards are standards that uh, everybody agrees that they're so good that they're, as, as, that they're all going to, to follow them. Um, so, for instance, um, is anybody familiar with the semiconductor industry at all? Um, semiconductor industry has um, a consortium called um, Semi Semiconductor Equipment Manufacturers International Semi. And um, they have no regulations that govern, I mean, other than the, the OSHA regulations, like everybody else has to follow. <clears throat> but internally, as a consortium, they've set up standards for health and safety, for uh, environmental, uh, for a, a wide variety of things that go way beyond the CFRs. 
and they're a lot more stringent. Uh, that's not that common, but it does it does occur, and that, that's for the equipment manufacturers, but the semiconductor industry, the people who make the semiconductors themselves, uh, have have a similar organization. And I'm trying to think of it; it's, it's slipping my mind at the moment, but. Uh, they come up with standards, consensus standards, amongst all the, the um, member organizations and member uh, companies, and Intel, uh, uh, Texas Instruments, and and mm -hmm. Dex. Uh, what's the other big uh, microchip manufacturer? Big competitor with um, uh, Intel. AMD. AMD. Yeah, AMD. I knew it started with the name. Um, the, 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 they're they're the, the member companies, and they all conform to the standards uh, because they voluntarily join the consortium and they uh, and by joining the consortium they, they agree to the standards. Uh, but beyond that, like I said, there's there's DOD and MIL standards which are pretty uh, extensive. Um, the one that is most, and I notice I, 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 I uh, listed 882C and 882D separately. Uh, not only do they have different titles, but they have different contents as well. Uh, I, I've never seen that in the mill standards before. Usually they're the same title and, as far as I know, uh, the same title and, and just and revised contents. But these are drastically different when you look at them. Um, so I listed them both. I, and I think I gave you a copy, I, I downloaded a copy of 882D uh, for you to look at. And then they have a, an entire standard based on failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis. Uh, the criticality part of it is because they include probability. It's not just qualitative. Um, so that's, um, and when we get to uh, looking at, uh, that's FMECA, when we get to talking about FMECA, uh, I'm going to refer to that in Bill Standard 1629 extensively. Uh, some other standards, um, and this I got, interestingly enough, from uh, a graduate of this program who is now a subcontractor, he works for a subcontractor at NASA, and um, he's in, in system safety uh, 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 with NASA. And he said, this is some of the things that they now rely on. And uh, so I just thought I'd put them in the notes so that you would have, have them for your reference. Not that I want to go into any, a great deal of detail about any of these, um, but the aerospace recommended practice, and, and, and the, the, the source of that is, is through, uh, apparently, from SA, SAE International. Um, there's a, a, an advisory circular and an IEEE uh, standard. Uh, but once again, none of these are, um, are um, um, requirements. And then none of these are, are, are regulations. They're just standards that have been written. Uh, this is software. In airborne systems, so um, th those are just like I said. I put those in there for your uh, for your reference. Reference. This one does um, uh, ultimately is expressed in a CFR. That's the only one that is that actually becomes um, uh, a CFR. All right, and once again, this is just to show you some of the ways that um, system safety is managed. This is all managerial. Uh, this is from the MIL standard 882C, version C, which is an ND, I don't believe. Um, and the way they organize it is by the task number. If you notice, it, it, it's a 100 series, 200 series, 300 series, 400 series. And then they have, they designate a type, and then they designate the program phase with, with a, a letter that indicates whether it is selectively, generally, generally applicable to design change only, or not applicable. Um, in, uh, in, in the, depending on the program phase. So for instance, the system safety program development is 102, system safety program plan. It's a management task and is generally applicable in all phases. Well, that makes sense. Okay, there's nothing profound there. But it, this is kind of helpful if you're setting up a PERT chart or some kind of um, way to, um, to uh, uh, plan your, your, your program to have a guide like this uh, if you are managing the system safety process at a, at a, at a company. Um, so uh, the, the 100 plans or the 100 uh, series tasks are the highest level, mostly uh, managerial. Um, 
And then when you get to the 200 series tasks, then you get to into engineering tasks, uh, 300 and three and 400 series tasks are the same thing. Uh, the 300 series, uh, you have engineering tasks that are more low level, and then finally the 400 series is uh, is, is specific, uh, much more specific um, tasks. All of them being, and well, most of them being engineering, uh, but uh, some of those being management as well. And then you can tell how it should be, how it's applicable in different phases of your uh, of your program. And uh, the, 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 the program phases, by the way, I didn't define that. I defined that here. Uh, uh, concept exploration, demonstration, validation. And this is, I don't know why they don't use the same um, the system safety life cycle, but they decide to find their own life cycle here in, in phases zero through four, in five, five different phases. Um, this is a program plan. Uh, that uh, is outlined in BAR. It's not part of the mill standard, uh, but the, the organization is more interesting here than, uh, than, than the content of it, I think. And, and that we, once again, in part one, you set up pro policy, program and policy administration. Part one is the high level, where you decide how you're going to manage your process. Um, purpose, scope, for policy objectives, system safety, administration, and organization, how you're going to manage that. Um, the, um, your methodology and assessment techniques, uh, your, how you're going to verify, and then how you're going to train your people, and uh, how you're going to manage your risk, and then your accident reporting, uh, emergency prepare. I mean, this is sort of a laundry list of everything that you should be thinking of in the process of doing your, your program plan. And then when you get to phase two, um, is that then you have your system safety plans and procedures. Now this is where you do your very specific uh, oper hazardous operations construction, safety design requirements where you do your system, your, your um, uh, hazard analyses would be, uh, and the engineering aspects of it would be in this, in this phase right here, the operational safety requirements. And that is my brief introduction to the managerial aspect of system safety. Like I said, I, other than making you aware of it, this is so uh, dependent upon your application that I, I think to, to uh, dwell on it and to make any more than, than specific, uh, to make any more than general um, um, Outlines is a little is not very not particularly useful, but it is pretty easily applicable once you get to um, uh, once you get to a specific program, specific application.